Origin Chan Song's reacts in this is Russia's nuclear missile explodes in Putin's face. This is the latest video, literally just an hour ago, posted by Military Show. It's another military show video. Military show titles can sometimes be, uh, you know, like biased or clickbaity type. But when you watch the video, it's like filled with like fact enough. I, I'm not gonna say unbiased, because what is unbiased? Even the most unbiased ones are not unbiased. But why am I watching this video right now? Because I watched a video about like how America's like, you know, uh, nuclear or tactical nukes and how America forgot how to make nukes, this and that, like what is the stockpile of America, I think it was from Sandbox. And people told me like, uh, you know, the, you know, the, you know, Russia has, has been like uh, doing these tests about that 50 megaton nuclear bomb, which is like Tsar Bomba level thing. And they haven't been that much successful. So I couldn't find that much video, but then just happened to be this video poster just like an hour ago. It's like, yeah, let's watch this one. Remember, if you like my reaction, don't forget to subscribe so that way I know which type of videos to react to more. Uh, check out the reaction, there's a link in the season. And yeah, let's do it. Dubbed the Satan 2 was first tested in 2022. The country's president, Vladimir Putin, called it a truly unique weapon that would force other countries threatening Russia to think twice. He also said the missile had the highest tactical and technical characteristics and had no analogues in the world. Fast forward to 2024, and it seems the only thing truly unique about the Satan 2 is its ability to self-destruct before even leaving the test launch pad, making one wonder if even the missile has had enough of Putin's leadership. The failed test did send shockwaves, not across the globe as Putin had envisioned, but directly into the face of his regime's overblown rhetoric. But how did this mighty weapon of mass embarrassment manage to fail so spectacularly? And how do we even know about it, given the Kremlin's obsession with keeping its disasters under wraps? We've got all the answers for you in this video. Now, one question might arise instantly. What is Russia doing testing nuclear missiles while the country is itself falling apart at the seams? Two and a half years into what was supposed to be a David versus Goliath conflict, Ukraine, aka David, has managed to assume the role of the invader with its incursion into the Kursk region and embarrass Goliath on pretty much a daily basis. And here Putin and his cronies are playing missile launch bingo. Well, this wannabe nuclear test was actually a desperate ploy to salvage Russia's reputation through intimidation. Once touted as possessing the second strongest military in the world, Russia has now become a laughingstock on the Ukrainian battlefield, facing humiliation and defeat at every turn since the invasion began. That's why Putin and his lapdogs have been scrambling to save face, and with the Russian soldiers falling like flies, their supposedly superior tanks reduced to scrap metal by Bradley fighting vehicles, essentially glorified battle taxis, and their once mighty Black Sea fleet getting wrecked by a country with no navy, the last thing Putin can boast of is the country's nuclear arsenal. And boy did he take his last ditch effort seriously. First, Putin announced that Russia... Yeah, I'm pretty sure like this has been in works for like a long time, right? Uh, when I was trying to find videos, I found like informational videos that are like seven, eight years old. So this is not really a new thing, but I guess they're testing recently. Now, yes, it could be everything the military show talks about, like just flags, or it could be last ditch attempt because either they are, they are afraid that people will, NATO will take that weakness as a show and like attack Russia or whatever, I don't know what kind of paranoid thoughts might go through people in power, in Kremlin basically. So this, this could be two things, either it's just a flex or they're preparing to nuke something. So if this actually works and it's just like, they actually nuke, let's just say Ukraine or something, that is catastrophic, right? It's like, uh, you know, we tried to end this quickly, but I guess you forced our way and we have to like use nukes because we are um, one, of the, one of the two biggest nuclear powers on the planet. US and Russia basically have all the nukes. Everybody has kind of like crumbs of it, right? Thousands of nukes, both of them have. So Russia is like, yeah, we tried to do this this way, but I guess you forced our hand and just blame the West or NATO. In the end, the result will be catastrophic if they do that right so this is my fear right every video i make like this i always bitch about that like nuclear nuclear apocalypse might just be there it's 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 just hanging by a thread and people are like oh it's just like bitching for nothing not really you you have no idea how simple it is to just like cross a certain line would suspend its participation in the nuclear arms pact called the new start treaty back in february 2023 this pact, the last remaining nuclear arms control pact involving both Russia and the US, 
was designed to limit the number of nuclear warheads each country could possess. It was a symbolic gesture of stability and restraint in an increasingly volatile world. But with the tide of war turning against him, Putin tore up the rulebook on nuclear arms control in an effort to project an image of power and intimidate his enemies. This is also when Putin first announced that Russia would resume nuclear testing because its number one enemy, the US, was doing so as well. And the US certainly did, conducting a Minuteman III Intercontinental Ballistic Missile ICBM, test launch in September of 2023. But you see, the difference between this test and the one that would take place in Russia a year later is that the US actually managed to launch its missile. Believe it or not, the ICBM's re-entry vehicle even managed to- Hold up there. So Putin is saying, right, US did the test, so we're gonna do it well. Like, why is US doing that then? Like, why give fuel to somebody that like, now they can just like, yeah, we can do it because US, US did the first, not us. So uh, there were treaties and things like, you shouldn't do this, like, you know, like, oh, that, does that not apply to this one? I'm confused about this. Like the treaties already you shouldn't like reduce the number of nukes, not increase it. Does that only apply to like making of the nukes and not really testing the missiles or something? Because I'm pretty sure North Korea is still doing that. They don't care. But between US and Russia, did US did the first one with the September 23 one? Where they launched it like Russia is like, yeah, see, US is doing that. So we're going to do that too. Because if that's the case, and if this goes out of hand, it's like, why are you giving fuel to Russia? Right? Like, okay, we are going to test it. So now they are free to do that as well to travel roughly 4,200 miles to the Kwajalein Atoll in the Marshall Islands. Now that's just showing off. Naturally, Russia initially thought it could replicate the US's success and one-up their adversary. So Sergei Karakayev, the commander of the Strategic Missile Forces of the Russian Federation, announced that the country intended to carry out seven ICBM tests in 2024. The ultimate fate of these tests might be deserving of an entirely separate video. But for this one, here's how Putin and his propaganda posse tried to paint a picture of invincibility behind Russia's nuclear arsenal. Knowing that all this talk ends in an epic embarrassment makes the following attempts at posturing all the more entertaining. Let's start with the Kremlin's spin doctor-in-chief, Putin. In June 2024, Putin held a now rare press conference with senior editors from international media outlets. At the conference, Putin once again threatened to use nuclear weapons and even provided a justification for it. Here's what he said. We have a nuclear doctrine. Look what it says. If someone's actions threaten our sovereignty and territorial integrity, we consider it possible for us to use all means at our disposal. This should not be taken lightly, superficially. In September 2022, Putin boldly declared that Ah, that's another one of my fears. All the treaties and all the things that they say, there's going to be loopholes there. Basically how NATO's, what is it, Article 5 or whatever that is, where NATO has to respond. No, they don't have to respond, right? There was, I saw a lot of videos, it's like, countries don't have to respond. It's like there's a loopholes like that. It doesn't force somebody to respond. Shit like that, like this tweet, like Putin just said there, like if you threaten our sovereignty, like who's going to interpret what is threatening our sovereignty is? So that's what I'm saying, like crossing that line might be too easy than people are thinking, oh, surely nobody's going to use nukes. You don't know, man. If Ukraine Russia wars goes the other way, it's like it's going right now, uh, Ukraine took over Kursk and now with the Western support, Ukraine does more and more damage to Russia. There'll be a breaking point where Russia is like, okay, we can't take anymore. We have to sh use nukes because I'm a nuclear country and Ukraine is not. You think like, oh, US is going to respond. But Russia is not nuking US, it's nuking Ukraine. Is US really going to respond? Because like, you know, if you throw stone at somebody, somebody might throw back. So at least right now it's just like, oh, they just nuke Ukraine, didn't you nuke US. And if we nuke Russia now, what if Russia nukes US now? So until two nuclear power fights each other, there's not going to be surety of like mutual destruction. So not use the nuke. So if Russia actually uses nuke in Ukraine, that's going to be a problem, right? So response, who knows what's going to happen after that? And if, if that becomes successful and no, nothing happens. And by the way, you, uh, Russia just nukes Ukraine and there you go, war over, Russia won, world moves on. Now there's a precedent. Like China could nuke India, Pakistan could nuke India, India could nuke somebody else, France can do... People can just now use nukes, even the tactical ones, small ones, that's just fucked up. That he was not bluffing, so it seems that he has traded his bravado for a more cautious tone. This might be due to the fact that reality has caught up with his bluster, leaving him with a hefty dose of humility. Or perhaps it has to do with the fact that it was proven time and time again that he was, in fact, 
bluffing. The latest red line that caused Putin's threats, Ukraine receiving permission to strike Russian soil with Western-supplied weapons, is probably the 100th red line he's drawn in the sand. Each time he declares it the point of no return, only to watch Ukraine charge forward, rendering his warnings as hollow as his military promises. The next in line to threaten nuclear annihilation and essentially hype up a massive failure is Dmitry Medvedev, the deputy secretary of the Russian Security Council and arguably the clown prince of the Kremlin. Russia's former president took to Telegram in September of 2024 to threaten to turn Kyiv into a giant blot of molten grey mess. Although Medvedev's erratic Telegram ramblings are too good not to be shared in their entirety, we'll give you a synopsis for the sake of brevity and sanity. Medvedev started off his message by describing how the Western world sees the Russian threats of nuclear annihilation. He said that the West believed that the Russians won't cross the line and that they only wanted to scare the West. And anyway, who needs an apocalypse, he added. And that's probably the only sane part of his entire message, together with deeming the nuclear conflict a very bad story with a dire outcome and calling a nuclear response a hugely complex decision with irreversible consequences. Hearing this, you might even think that Medvedev had a moment of clarity, a brief flash of reason amidst the chaos of his usual bombast. But no such luck, for in the very next line he said, What the pompous Anglo-Saxon dimwits fail to admit though, is that you can only test someone's patience for so long. It will turn out in the end that certain moderate Western analysts were right when they warned, True, the Russians are not likely to use this response, although it's still a possibility. He then ended his message by saying, And then it's over. A giant blot of molten grey mess in the place where the mother of Russian cities, the historic name of Kyiv, once stood. He even threw in an English expletive at the end for good measure. With this bizarre message in mind, you'll probably... You th you would hope that people are sane and not use nukes. See, only example I can think of is like somebody walks inside a bank or a shop to loot it with a gun. They have a gun. People comply because they have a gun or a person has a gun. That person did not go there to die. That person go there to loot the bank or whatever and run away, right? Or whatever. Dying is not his part of the you know deal. But people still comply because they still have a gun. And you don't know when a person's breaking point comes and just like uses the gun regardless of what, right? Yeah, the, you know, even in video games, they show like negotiation meter or whatever, right? In Witcher 3, if you, uh, contr if you do Witcher contract, there's a limit before a person gets a breaking point. It's like, I don't care. Do it at the promised price or don't do it at all type of way, even though we're threatened by monsters and we need you. So there's a breaking point psychologically. That's the problem. Yes, okay, it might just be threat, but if a breaking point comes and actually they use it, everybody's fucked. That's the problem with nukes, right? It works great at a deterrent, but that deterrent doesn't work like it's, it's apocalyptic. We understand why the US Department of State answered what they referred to as standard Kremlin nonsense with one sentence. We know by now not to take Medvedev seriously. The final piece of the propaganda puzzle came from Sergei Lavrov, Russia's Minister of Foreign Affairs and the Kremlin's Master of Misdirection. Mere days before the Satan II missile exploded in Putin's face, Lavrov delivered a theatrical warning to the West, promising that Moscow's nuclear arsenal was at full combat readiness. In a speech that seemed to rip straight from a B-movie script, Lavrov declared, We talk about red lines, expecting that our assessments, statements will be heard by intelligent, decision-making people. He added that he was convinced that in such situations, decision-makers have an idea of what the Kremlin is talking about, as nobody wants a nuclear war. Lavrov's remarks were supposed to set the stage for this massive test, a show of force meant to intimidate anyone who dared question Russia's resolve. But instead of instilling dread, it became evident that the whole plan was destined for disaster, as Lavrov waxed poetic about the weapons whose use will involve grave consequences for the masters of the Ukrainian regime. The only thing he truly managed to achieve was to make the failure of the upcoming launch all the more laughable. Speaking of the launch, or of the attempt to launch, rather, let's finally break down what happened on that fateful day in September. According to Pavel Podvig, the analyst running the Russian Nuclear Forces Research Project, the attempted launch of the Satan II likely took place on September 9, 2024. Podvig made this conclusion based on a Notice to Air Missions, or NOTAM for short, issued to the pilots in the area on September 17 and cancelled two days later on September 19. The NOTAM notification is a crucial safety measure in aviation, informing pilots of any potential hazards in the vicinity. In this case, it appears that the Russian military was attempting to create a no-fly zone for the imminent missile test, likely hoping to ensure that nothing would interfere with their grand display of firepower. 
The display in question was supposed to occur at the Plesetsk Cosmodrome, a strategic location nestled in the Arkhangelsk region of Russia. Situated approximately 500 miles north of Moscow and about 250 miles east of Finland's border, this spaceport is the northernmost operational orbital launch site in the world. Originally developed as an ICBM site for the Soviet R-7 Semyorka missile developed during the Cold War, Plesetsk has evolved into a hub for various military and satellite launches, making it a critical asset in Russia's defense and space capabilities. With this in mind, it's no wonder this location, surrounded by dense boreal pine forests and flat terrain, was chosen to be the stage for a powerful display of Russian military might. However, the only thing it ended up being was a backdrop for another colossal failure coming from Russia. This time, the failure involved the RS-28 Sarmat Super Heavy Intercontinental Ballistic Missile that we've been referring to by its colloquial name, Satan-2. Let's get to know this infamous missile a little better before it inevitably stumbles its way into the annals of military bloopers. The RS-28 Sarmat is a three-stage, silo-based, liquid-fueled ICBM designed to replace the Soviet-era R-36M model in Russia's arsenal. As you can probably guess, the R-36M was the original Satan, courtesy of NATO reporting names. With a length of 115.8 feet and a diameter of almost 10 feet, the Satan II boasts a hefty launch weight of around 460,000 pounds. Thanks to a rather impressive operational range of 11,000 miles, the Satan II could target virtually any location in the US and Europe with precision. That is, of course, if it managed to actually launch first. All jokes aside, the RS-28 missile being grounded is the best-case scenario for the rest of the world. Why? Because the missile can carry up to 10 tons of payload. The sheer amount of payload translates to a variety of warhead options, including hypersonic glide vehicles, multiple independently targetable re-entry vehicles, and of course, nuclear warheads. In total, the Sarmat can reportedly carry up to 10 large warheads and 16 smaller ones. This menacing versatility and impressive capacity is what makes the RS-28 a significant component of Russia's strategic deterrent capability. It was one of six Russian strategic weapons unveiled by Putin in 2018 with a promise to bolster Russia's military might in an increasingly tense global landscape. So for now, we know that the Satan II was introduced in 2018 and first tested in 2022. This means that we aren't talking about some old Soviet-era weapon that was doomed to fail due to sheer age and questionable engineering. No, this is supposed to be a cutting-edge missile that's fresh off the assembly line. And yet, on September 19th, instead of roaring through the skies, the Satan II dramatically, unequivocally, and embarrassingly stayed put. In other words, the supposed ICBM test failed before it even began. Here are all the details we know. According to Podvig, the Sarmat likely exploded while being defueled, leaving a massive crater in the ground. Reports of the incident first emerged on social media, notably from the open-source analyst active on X, formerly Twitter, under the handle at MENMYRC1. The analyst in question noted that the missile detonated in the silo, essentially obliterating the surrounding launch site. This was later confirmed by multiple major news outlets. Now you might wonder, how can a missile wreak such havoc before even taking off? The answer lies in Sarmat's capabilities, which we've already discussed in this video. For a missile to be able to reach distances of up to 11,000 miles, how can a missile do that? I mean, it's a missile with that much fuel in it. Of course, it can explode like that. So it was a, uh, you know, some kind of a maintenance failure or a mistake or some shit, right? Because it blew up inside the silo while defueling. So it's not like during the launch it's failed or something. Because that's what I assume, like it launched and there was some kind of a failure. No, somebody fucked up. It has to pack a lot of fuel. Of course, all this fuel creates more than enough explosive potential on board the missile. Simply put, when things went awry, the fuel did what fuel does when ignited. It exploded. Now, this answer might surprise you, as we've been referring to the Satan II as a nuclear missile. However, while this missile is certainly nuclear capable, it's important to note that it wasn't loaded with any nuclear warheads during this catastrophic test. That's the main thing people need to realize. This is a missile test. It's they're testing the vehicle. That's what it's, Anybody knows anything about space or how NASA and everything works, it's, this same thing apply here. It's a vehicle that can carry a lot of those things. He wasn't carrying it while it exploded, obviously. And it doesn't necessarily mean even if did, it did explode while having nukes, that nuke would have detonated. It's not so easy to detonate nuke. But obviously, it's a thermo uh, nuclear bomb, fusion bomb, which requires heat to explode. Now, would they have triggered enough heat? I don't think it would have tr triggered enough heat because you need to trigger a fission bomb that is inside now. That wouldn't have triggered just if it exploded. So, th there's some chance that it might have, but yeah, probably not. 
but yeah, it didn't have a nuke in it. What's more, the mere fact that this was indeed a test tells us that the missile was not carrying any real warheads, just dummy warheads used for data-taking purposes. But how do we know the Sarmats didn't take off and merely exploded close to the ground? There are two key reasons. Number one, the destruction surrounding the missile silo indicates a failure shortly after ignition. According to Timothy Wright from the International Institute for Strategic Studies, this indicates that the first stage of the missile either failed to ignite properly or suffered a catastrophic mechanical failure, causing it to fall back into the... Yeah, so during defueling, as in it's, as soon as it starts to like trigger some, something fucked up, right? So it could be that somebody fucked up or some kind of a... somebody didn't check the checks or something or just like rushed it or something. ...the silo and explode. Number two, during typical missile tests, NATO's Cobra Ball reconnaissance aircraft is always deployed to monitor the launch. However, the absence of this aircraft during the final stages of the test suggests that the missile never left the ground. The silence from these keen-eyed watchers speaks volumes. If they're not up in the air, you can bet there's nothing worth watching. It seems that much like its Supreme Commander Putin, the Satan II is all talk and no action. But wait a second, how do we even know about this failure in the first place? It's not like Russia would eagerly broadcast such a colossal blunder. That's where open source intelligence saves the day. Thanks to satellite imagery analyzed by experts, we've got a front row seat to the carnage. The analysts we mentioned just now at MENMYRC1 first shared satellite imagery provided by Planet Labs, a US-based Earth imaging company. The image in question, captured on September 21, 2024 at 6.50 a.m. Coordinated Universal Time, offers an undeniable glimpse of the destruction. When compared to earlier satellite images from July 10 of the same location, it's abundantly clear that something went disastrously wrong. What was once a pristine launch site has now been reduced to a crater-strewn mess. The stark contrast between the before and after image, as well as the 200-foot-wide crater, leaves little doubt. This was a failed test, and a spectacular one at that. But here's the kicker. Anyone who knows the testing history of the RS-28 Sarmat missile won't be surprised by this outcome. How so? Remember the first test of this missile we mentioned at the beginning, the one in 2022? Well, that's also the only successful test flight it ever had. Since then, which was April of 2022, it was one failure after another. Take February 2023. Just two days before President Joe Biden's visit to Kyiv. Wait a minute, how do you have a successful launch and then failure happens? That makes me think that it's not like missiles not working. It's like either there's some shortcomings based on budget, or like people are just like not mean not like checking it properly or something like that. Like there's like a whatever maintenance command structure, whatever that is, they're fucking up constantly. Because if missile was just a failure, it wouldn't have a successful launch, would it? So, like, shit is happening afterwards. Russia tried to flex its muscles by testing Sarmat again. But instead of a triumphant show of power, the test was a complete flop. According to the Russian independent news outlet Sirena, the Sarmat fell shortly after taking off with virtually no explanation. US officials later confirmed that the missile failed miserably adding another strike to its growing list of failures. Never one to admit defeat, Russia attempted another test shortly after the embarrassing February setbacks. Spoiler alert, it also failed. In fact, the entire launch was cancelled due to a failure in the missile's centralized control system. Fast forward to October 2023 and we have yet another failure, but this time the telemetry system failed. According to Sirena, this failure was explained by a human error. In November 2023, the Sarmat fell 77 seconds into the flight, landing some 186 miles from the launch site. Just as with the test in February, there was no explanation of what went wrong. And then came September 2024, when things really hit rock bottom, quite literally. So what we're left with is a so-called cutting-edge weapon that spent more time digging craters than flying through the air. Now, you might think that this outright humiliating track record would be enough to dissuade Russia from parading Satan II as their crown jewel of military innovation. But surprise, this missile officially entered operational service in September 2023, becoming the world's longest range and most powerful extant ICBM system. On paper, of course. Even after the explosion we've discussed in this video and the subsequent destruction of its launch site, Nikolai Sokov, a former Russian and Soviet arms control official, said that Moscow would likely persist with the Sarmat program. Apparently, when your missile is better at landscaping than launching, the only logical move is to just keep digging. The Kremlin, for its part, has stayed remarkably tight. Yeah, look, man, I'm, I understand all the talk behind it, but they did have a successful launch and they can pursue the failures while they're happening and they can iron it out. So I can see this missile being operational like in soon basically in a year or so. 
based on the track record, right? I get it, like, you know, there were a lot of failures, but they did have a successful launch in 2022. And since then, they did more, like, three, four more tests in just two years. So next two years, they can do multiple tests and iron things out. I can see it being operational, right? You can say a lot of things about Russia, but they know how to make missiles, right? Uh, they've been, like, uh, they've been the first people in space. They are the one who did the rocket thing, right? Uh, you know, the International Space Station is also a Russian, and, yeah, it's things like that, right? Collaboration and everything. So missile is one thing Russia can do, right? Nowadays, it's, like, basically budget issue because of the war, this and that. But they can iron things out, right? Let's be honest. Lipped. When questioned about the alleged explosion, Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov dodged the issue entirely, stating, We do not have any information on this matter. In classic fashion, they passed the buck to the Russian Ministry of Defense, which, unsurprisingly, offered no comment either. It seems that in Russia, when missiles fail, so does transparency. As for the rest of the world, reactions have been mixed, though largely unimpressed. Tom Caraco, the director of the Center for Strategic and International Studies Missile Defense Project, dismissed the latest Sarmat test as mere nuclear saber-rattling. He pointed out that while the U.S. is working to modernize its own nuclear forces, which are relatively older, Russia has been throwing considerable efforts into projects like the Sarmat. And yet, despite all that effort, the Sarmat's recent track record suggests it's more of a paper tiger than a fearsome beast. Worst of all, the Sarmat failures are far from the only unsuccessful tests of nuclear weaponry in Russia. On June 30th, 2023, Russia tried to test its Poseidon apparatus, officially known as Status 6 Oceanic. I was about to say that, like, is this the same, uh, you know, at first I'm like, is it the same as Poseidon? But then I realized, wait a minute, this is a ground-based one, this is different, this is Sarmat missile, which is ground-based missile. But what about the Poseidon one? I heard about Poseidon, like, ooh, Russia is making this Poseidon submarine with a, like, insane hyper-power nuclear missile and shit that makes it, like, really deadly submarine. Like, what happened to that one? I guess now we're gonna know. Organic multi-purpose system. This was one of the six strategic weapons Putin announced in 2018, together with the RS-28 Sarmat. The Poseidon is an underwater nuclear-capable torpedo designed to hit coastal areas, ships, and naval bases. When tested in June, this torpedo was reportedly thrown off the silo, after which it sank. The reason behind this failure was a faulty sensor, which prevented the reactor from starting. Surprisingly, this fiasco- Hold up, the nuclear torpedo? Why the fuck? Uh, is this a n normal thing? Do countries have nuclear torpedo? Is it like a new thing they're trying out? Because even with submarine, I always assume like, uh, you know, like ICBMs, right? Submarine, it launches from the water, goes over the air, at least on the air, if you like even destroy the missile, it's in the air and all that is fine. Underwater torpedo, like, even if you disable it and explodes, it still explodes underwater, causing maybe tsunamis or even earthquakes, not to mention like irradiating water and all that shit. Why nuclear torpedo, man? Go seems to have rattled Russia a bit since the next launch, scheduled for late October or early November, was postponed, and no other tests have been reported since. Another wildly unsuccessful test took place on October 25th, 2023 when Putin himself was supposed to oversee a series of so-called presidential launches. While the Kremlin claimed everything went off without a hitch, Sirena reported that the RS-24 Yars missile fell during the second phase of its flight, while the RSM-56 Bulava missile was cancelled at the last moment. The former weapon is a thermonuclear-armed intercontinental ballistic missile with a range of roughly 6,525 miles and the ability to carry multiple, independently targetable, re-entry vehicles. The latter is a submarine-launched ballistic missile developed for Russia's Borai-class nuclear submarines. This missile has a range of around 5,150 miles and can also carry multiple warheads. But what does the Russian president think about the failure of his launches and all the other failures we've mentioned in the video? Well, for Putin, it's business as usual. Threats, propaganda, and some well-crafted deflection. At the moment, he's laser-focused on preventing the United Kingdom from allowing Ukraine to use British-made Storm Shadow long-range missiles against Russian targets. He previously failed to do the same with the US, which supplied Ukraine with longer-range ATACMS, Army Tactical Missile System, missiles, and allowed its armed forces to use these missiles to strike Russian soil. On September 25th, mere days after the catastrophic nuclear missile explosion on the same soil, Putin issued yet another warning to the West. 
During a meeting of Russia's Security Council, Putin revealed that the Kremlin was updating its nuclear doctrine in response to what he described as a rapidly changing global landscape filled with new threats and risks. A significant aspect of this updated doctrine is the stipulation that any aggression against Russia by a non-nuclear state, particularly if supported by a nuclear power, would be viewed as a joint attack on Russia. This broadens the scope of perceived threats and escalates the potential for nuclear engagement. Putin articulated specific. Yeah, I'm not. Su I'm surprised that wasn't already a thing, right? Like, if you supply a country at the level that you West is supplying Ukraine, like, of course, like you know, like that, that might as well be like joint attack at that point, because there's no way in hell Ukraine can fight Russia by its own self because of the West's like support and all the equipment and they're taking. They actually not just defend themselves but attack Russia themselves. So I guess even Russia didn't realize that West is going to support Ukraine at that level when they when they launch their special military operation. But now they're realizing like, wait a minute, this can happen. Like, but if you like really notice how the world economy and world organizations have been working, how like NATO and everything was working, you should have seen that coming, right? Like, of course, people in mass, most of the NATO countries, most of the Western Western countries are going to support Ukraine like that. You should have seen that coming specific conditions under which Russia might transition to nuclear weapon use, particularly in the event of a large-scale assault involving missiles, aircraft, or drones. He emphasized that the use of nuclear weapons could also be warranted if Russia or its ally Belarus faced conventional aggression. These remarks signify a significant shift in Moscow's nuclear posture, allowing for a wider interpretation of when nuclear weapons could be deemed necessary. It's obvious that Putin will do as much mental gymnastics as necessary to try and justify his increasingly aggressive stance. Just days before the latest Sarmat missile disaster. If it's a mental gymnastic, like I said, it could be either thing, right? We hope it's a mental gymnastic and just like a threat and nothing else so nuclear war doesn't happen. But if it's not a mental gymnastic, they're like, okay, you know what, enough of like, enough of like bad image we are having where we are just losing left and right we have to use nukes now to show people like we are still nuclear power or something because Ukraine is not a nuclear power right that's the fucked up thing and there you go lines ha has been crossed and no going back Putin held a press conference that can only be described as a masterclass in the art of deflection with a straight face, he spun a tale about why the potential use of Western-supplied long-range weapons against Russian territory was just too much to bear. It seems that in Putin's world, the Ukrainian army is utterly incapable of operating high-tech weapons without NATO's hand-holding. In his classic style, he claimed that only NATO military personnel can assign flight missions, implying that the only way these long-range weapons were being used in Ukraine is through direct NATO involvement. Pu I mean, kinda. Come on, man. Oh, by the way, NATO are like teaching Ukrainians how to use this, like how fast though. And like, it's not that easy. So yeah, in the background, in the back channels where nobody's noticing, there must be a lot of NATO soldiers and like technicians and experts working there. Come on. That's just like any, anyone with two brain cells can think that. Come on. Putin went on to declare that any NATO involvement in the conflict would be tantamount to a declaration of war against Russia. He argued, if this decision to use long-range weapons is made, it will mean nothing short of direct involvement. And NATO's direct involvement in Ukraine is an act of war, according to Putin. His exact words were, This will mean that NATO countries, the United States and European countries, are at war with Russia. And if this is the case, then, bearing in mind the change in the essence of the conflict, we will make appropriate decisions in response to the threats that will be posed to us. But let's be honest here. This whole speech is just a thinly veiled attempt to shield himself from the mounting pressure of military failures on the ground. After all, if his missiles are blowing up in his own backyard, the last thing he wants is for anyone to think he can't handle a little Western assistance. But what do you think about Putin's claim? Yeah. <sighs> I don't know what's the difference between that. Like, okay, he's saying that it's because of his all this failure is happening, but yeah, that is why he's saying it. It's like it's uh, how are those two things different? Yes, all this failure is happening, and he's saying like, okay, all the NATO supplies is making Ukraine stronger, and that is why he's making this threat. Obviously, even Putin himself will tell you this. Then he did, like all this long missile thing and all that. If you do that, you might as well be war at us, right? NATO might as well be attacking us. Yeah, and that is why he's threatening so I don't know how these two things are different but that is the thing right so I don't know man right I don't like this right uh, this video basically military show just said like oh he's just flexing he's just flexing but we can't be sure of that that's the problem here and Ukraine is not a nuclear power Ukraine is not part of NATO 
Russia can use nukes against Ukraine and just like deflect everyone else and NATO might not respond or the nuclear power might not respond. But Russia did use the nukes now and it's, it's a precedent now. This is terrifying, especially someone like me, who's, you know, whose country is surrounded by two nuclear powers, like Pakistan and China, right? So once somebody, use, it's like, you know, once wars has started, look at the Russia-Ukraine war started, now the Middle East at a war. Didn't happen before, not at that scale. Just like once somebody crosses the line, everybody would do that. So once Russia uses the nuke and that line has been crossed, everybody's fucked. Who knows who's going to use nukes when? Because they will not be feeding uh, total annihilation or deterrent element of it. Because if nothing happens when Russia nukes somebody, why would something happen if somebody else uses nuke? Right? Iran might have nukes uh, somewhere else hidden, nobody knows about. Now they might use nukes. Pakistan can use nukes. China can use nukes. Anybody can use nukes now. Right? It's a precedent, which is the problem. Right? So I don't know about that. Right? I don't know if it's just flexing. Because if Russia's every part of the military fails, and if nuke doesn't fail, like they figure out how to use nukes and all it takes is one, they might use it, right? Just to show, like, doesn't matter what, we're still nuclear power. The, one of the top two nuclear powers still. Yeah. Well, well, that was Russia's nuclear missile explosion put in space by Channel Military Show. If you like my next channel, subscribe and I'll see you next time.